Oh my god, what a Not Sam Wrestling show we have for you today. Finn Balor is my guest, and we've got a lot to get into, including his match with Drew McIntyre, and we go into the history of everything that he did with NXT. Plus, we've got the XFL to talk about. So much going on with Becky Lynch and Daniel Bryan. More things to fix on Raw. It's Not Sam Wrestling, and it's now. This is Not Sam Wrestling. Introducing your host from New York, here is Sam Roberts. I'm in the zone, baby. I'm in the zone. I might have saved the best Not Sam Wrestling show of the year for one of the last Not Sam Wrestling shows of the year. There's only so many left in 2018, and this is going to be one of the best. Welcome. To Not Sam Wrestling, we got Finn Balor on the show today. Very, very thrilling. A lot to talk about with him. We got all the XFL teams, all the cities and stadiums. We got Raw, we got SmackDown. We got Rhino. We got so much to get into. It's Not Sam Wrestling, and I appreciate all you guys uh, streaming, downloading, doing whatever it is that you're doing to listen to this show on YouTube, on NotSam.com. Hopefully you're on Patreon. Oop, that was a little abrupt. At patreon.com slash notsamwrestling, the only spot to get captive audience bonus shows, the only spot to get the entire State of Wrestling segment on video, the only spot to get my pre-shows, whatever you want, it's available. The only spot to get these beautiful Not Sam chalk line jackets at patreon.com slash notsamwrestling. Now, I do want to uh, start by uh, doing a little in memoriam. And saying, uh, rest in peace to the Dynamite Kid. Now, to be fair, I would probably spend more time on this or jump into the state of wrestling with it. But I just am, I'm not the Dynamite Kid expert. There are people out there that are going to be able to do a much better job uh, sort of talking about the memories of the Dynamite Kid. I'm sure Wade Keller is going to do a tremendous job talking about the Dynamite Kid. He's a little bit before my time, but of course, you know, I, I popped in right at the end of the British Bulldogs WWE run, but the Dynamite Kid, first of all, I feel like his potential was never quite realized, you know, and that was because of uh, injuries that he had when he was young, but you look at the influence that he had in the world of wrestling, and you talk to guys, whether they're guys like Bret Hart, whether they're guys like uh, Chris Benoit as a performer, whether they're, they're guys like the High Flyers of the era, the Dynamite Kid was one of the most innovative superstars of the 80s. And quite frankly, you know, we talk about the idea that the WWE is the land of the giants and guys of a certain size have a tough time in WWE. That still comes up in 2018. I mean, it's really not true anymore. You know, when you look at the landscape, it's really not true. After Shawn Michaels, things really got opened up for guys of various sizes. But before Shawn Michaels, it was a very different world. And the fact that the Dynamite Kid, at his size, at his height, was able to get as far as he did, was able to make the impact that he did, was able to make the impression that he made in a world that was not designed for him. The WWE, at the time that the Dynamite Kid was around, was not designed for the Dynamite Kid to prosper, and he did anyway. And the reason that he did was because he was so good you know the the legacy of the British Bulldogs tag team I would hope that the British Bulldogs as a team go into the Hall of Fame this year you know I I think that for various reasons maybe you know well I won't even get into that but I do hope that the Dynamite Kid and Davey Boy Smith as a team go into the WWE Hall of Fame this year because I think that team if any team deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Just just such... That team was so important that it was able to launch Davey Boy Smith, the British Bulldog, into superstardom as a singles guy. You know, but everybody remembered him as a tag team act. Everybody remembered the British Bulldogs. That's what gave Davey Boy Smith his credibility when he showed up with the Braids. But you talk to anybody around in the late 80s, and they'll all, they'll all, all, go deep with the Dynamite Kid and talk about what an influence he was. And even into the 90s, 
You know, those guys that showed up a generation after the Dynamite Kid all talked about what an influence on them the Dynamite Kid was, his work and everything that he did. So rest in peace to the Dynamite Kid, a tremendously important superstar uh, in the history of not only the WWE but wrestling in general. Um, and yeah, yeah, I just think uh, somebody that should be talked about and remembered and thought about a lot and hopefully when the Hall of Fame gets to the ceremony, gets to the Barclays Center in a few months, uh, there's an acknowledgement of the work that the Dynamite Kid did in the WWE right alongside with Davey Boy Smith. Speaking of guys that have done tremendous work inside of the WWE, Finn Balor, whether he's the demon, whether he's just an extraordinary man, uh, has achieved a lot. And to me, is only getting better. You know, I, I, I think that there is something about Finn Balor that even when he's not given much, even when we start going like, is it another Baron Corbin Finn Balor match? Is it this? There's something about it that just compels us. There's as as fans, there's something about it that makes us go, yeah, but it's still a Finn Balor match. I want to see what what's going to happen here. Um, you know, I think I think the legacy of Finn Balor in the WWE is not even close to being done. It's still being written, but I think the first chapter has been tremendous so far. We talk to Finn Balor now about uh, everything that he's doing in the WWE currently and, you know, the fact that, look, this Friday, if you're listening to this when the podcast drops, 24 hours from now, tickets will officially go on sale, December 7th. Tickets will officially go on sale for Raw and SmackDown after WrestleMania, the Hall of Fame for 2019, and NXT TakeOver New York, all taking place in the Barclays Center. And... That leads us to a few things. Not only does that make me want to talk to Finn Balor about, you know, the Raw and the SmackDown after WrestleMania and where he may end up, but it makes me want to talk to Finn Balor about the the impact that that weekend has had on his career and that his career has had on that weekend, whether it's a takeover before WrestleMania in Dallas, whether it's the NXT live event that happened in, in uh, Palo Alto or wherever that was in California. Uh, San Jose, all very important stuff and all stuff that I want to talk about with Finn Balor. So let's do it right now on Not Sam Wrestling. It's Finn Balor. The Not Sam Wrestling interview. Well, now we welcome back to Not Sam Wrestling. He's the extraordinary man that can do extraordinary things, ladies and gentlemen. Finn Balor, welcome back, man. What's the haps? I'm good to hear from you, buddy. How are you? I'm good. Now, does this nickname, the uh, the extraordinary man that can do extraordinary things, <laughs> does this put like a ton of pressure on you before you go out there? You're like, okay, you know, I'm really promising a lot of stuff that is very far from ordinary. Uh, I, 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 uh, I, I got to be honest. I wasn't sure I was still being referred to as that. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew that was a thing like about four or five months ago, but uh, obviously like I don't watch my own... Uh, stuff on tv so i don't get to listen to the commentary so i wasn't sure if they're still referring to me as that but uh i don't know man i've been under pressure my whole life another little bit won't be won't do any harm yeah you know what you're probably right you seem to work best under pressure anyway right yeah when the lights are on man. red light district <laughs> so you just got back from mexico yeah we were uh we were in mexico on i think uh saturday night and then pretty much like straight after the show, we flew to Texas. And then from there, we flew to somewhere else in Texas. And we were in Texas last night. And then after the show, we drove like four hours to somewhere else in Texas. <laughs> so we're, somewhere, we're somewhere in Texas now for, uh, for Raw tonight. <laughs> when, at, at this point, does it even like register with you that you're in another country? I guess in, in the moment, you probably noticed that the fans are speaking a different language, but other than that, it seems like you're in and out so fast that you're just moving. Uh, it, when we get to the different countries, you can tell just like from the, you know, airports feel different, hotels feel different and stuff like that. But um, but like when I'm in the States, honestly, man, it's been a blur. Like uh, I thought I was in Dallas last night and I was like, oh, this is Dallas, right? And he's not. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> or it might have been flipped around. I'm not actually sure which one. <laughs> <laughs> have you gotten one of those moments yet where you've uh, thanked the audience or whatever, or done one of your promos where you go like, "And we love you, Dallas," and they're like, "It's Houston. What is he talking about?" <laughs> Thankfully, not yet. 
<laughs> yeah, I guess, but I guess you would know, like, beforehand, if you know you're going to be given a live microphone, you're like, okay, let me check the geography. Oh, yeah. no, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to double check everything. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, listen, um, the, the tickets for WrestleMania weekend, of course, WrestleMania has already gone on sale, which is, I would imagine, unbelievable, right? You spend so much time in NXT. Um, trying to get to the main roster and, and thinking about what it's going to be like and having these amazing takeover moments all with the goal to have moments at WrestleMania and shows like that. Now that you're, you're part of the main roster and have been for a couple of years, is it amazing how quickly you go from, I thought we just did WrestleMania to it's time to promote the fact that WrestleMania is on sale again and that NXT TakeOver and Hall of Fame and Raw and SmackDown are on sale for the next one? Yeah, uh, all that stuff goes on sale Friday. But yeah, it's uh, it's pretty wild. But you know, we we release these tickets so far in advance because obviously they're hot tickets. But uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of work to be done before then. You know, we still got TLC, we still got uh, Royal Rumble. It's a huge one. So like, I, I try not to like uh, overlook uh, what's kind of in the immediate uh, future uh, and try and like live as much in the present. Obviously, like WrestleMania is gonna roll around and we're gonna be like, oh man, is this WrestleMania again? But like. Uh, I try not to think too far ahead, like in in that sense, and uh, I just make sure I get to WrestleMania, and that's you know I got to get through tonight first, so uh, that's kind of my approach to everything. But yeah, like talking about going from like takeovers, like I remember being in uh, in Dallas for a takeover, and uh, like that seemed like you know the biggest show of you know what was going to be you know I was ever going to be involved in, and then just to see how things have grown so fast. Uh, kind of moving to the main roster is that it's been a pretty wild ride man. well i i mean i was thinking about you know the fact that takeover is going on sale again and that and that i'm talking to you about it but what i started thinking about was even before takeover you were on one of my favorite nxt live shows that i saw was the live show that they did wrestlemania weekend in san jose i think yeah yeah, yeah the, that was kind of like the precursor for what like takeovers were to become because uh that was kind of like our first large venue like out of state what we call like out of florida state uh, loops and uh that was wild man i remember like i remember a lot of like the the kind of the newer guys that were in nxt that like hadn't been around the business too much or hadn't been uh you know out on the indies that much and that show was announced they're like man are, are we gonna be able to fill this is this gonna be like uh what's this show gonna be like I like I remember, I'm getting goosebumps now thinking about it because I remember telling them like man, this is WrestleMania weekend. Every wrestling wrestling fan in the world is going to be there. They're going to be want to be involved in this show, and uh, this is going to be one of like the wildest crowds we've ever wrestled in front of. I'm like that prediction was right because like that night was like definitely a very very special night for me. I got to work against you know uh, Pac Neville, uh, you know one of the people who I think is one of the best in the world. And, uh, you know, we just tore the house down that night. My parents were in the front row, my brother, my uncle. Uh, it, w it was a wild night, man. And that was kind of, I think, the night that, like, NXT, like, really arrived, you know? Yeah, I would agree, because that was one of those things where it was, like, I don't know, 5,000 seats maybe? And it was this conversation of, I can't believe NXT thinks that they're going to do 5,000 seats. We've never seen anything like this. <laughs> like, it's so funny to think about now that that really was, even, yeah. like, fans were talking about it. Like, whoa, are people... Are people going to go? But then you go. That was the night that, like, Hideo hit the the GTS for the first time. That was the Sasha Banks-Charlotte match was the first time that people were like, oh, my God, women can main event a show. And then you and Neville show up and, and steal the show with the main event. It was, it, was, it was kind of the first, I feel like, takeover vibe show where every match was just building and building and building on it. And, and you were right. I mean, the fans were going absolutely wild from start to finish i've had pretty much goosebumps since we started talking about this <laughs> like wave and wave but yeah i think like uh did maybe like Sami Zayn and uh, attack kevin owens or vice versa on that show too like i, I know they didn't work but like yeah they were in the midst of their storyline too and uh i think you know it was real low budget you know there wasn't like a giant set mm -mm. it was just like the little curtain and uh it just felt so cool it felt like that was really like at the time what like NXT like represented was that like underground vibe and uh, I think that was uh, that that's a night that I'll never forget man. Yeah were you happy to be such a, a, a huge part of building that brand in the sense that like now I think NXT is in another building phase where they're getting to a whole nother level 
But really, you, Hideo, Joe showed up, Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, like you guys were the guys that took this thing from, you know, being a show that was at full sale to actually being a touring brand and actually being a conversation where that was the first weekend where people were going, I think the NXT show might've been the best show of the weekend. Well, uh, yeah, obviously like hugely proud to have been able to be in a part of that. And like, that was a real team effort. You know, there wasn't like one person that was like responsible for what, like what happened with NXT. I think the fact that, you know, we were all training together. We we're all trying to like, scrape by and get to the main roster but at the same time like we all felt like we had a point to prove and to prove that we did belong and uh, it was kind of like a bunch of misfits kind of like traveling around together uh, and like those road shows were like some of the best times of my career man uh, like personally like I was just I was having so much fun in the ring and mm-hmm. uh, the crowds were awesome like that those kind of smaller in, more intimate settings uh, you know where we would do like house shows in say Cleveland or, or uh, Columbus where it's like Two thousand people in like a in a rock music venue. Yeah, and, uh, you know that that was a real cool period uh, of NXT. It was like it was awesome to be involved in it. It felt like it had a really good underground buzz. And uh, now I think it's you know it's changed into something completely different. Where it's like it's super polished. Like the guys in there are incredible. They can like transition seamlessly like from from uh, from NXT to main roster. I, I believe like no problem. Like guys like Adam Cole and Ricochet. Uh, you know they're they're changing the game. So. Uh, it's uh, it's obviously cool to have been a part of it. I think it was a different NXT, mm-hmm. uh, but you know, I, th- I think the guys there like have evolved it into into something completely different. And uh, like, long may it continue to evolve, man. Because uh, you know, the more things stay the same, like I, I feel like people get bored. So if people, if you know, the next crop crop of uh, NXT guys come in and, and and continue to evolve it and change it, I think it's, it's going to be great for NXT. I feel like you were also one of the members of this class of like guinea pigs, where at the time they weren't necessarily WWE wasn't necessarily embracing guys like you and Sammy and Kevin and guys who had this tremendous career before coming to WWE. It was almost like, well, that's happening over there, and WWE is happening over here, and. I feel like it was you guys coming into NXT and doing shows like that that made the sort of that generation transition into something where no, there is this whole crop of guys that are making this career on the indies and and in Japan and and in Ring of Honor and all over the place that at one point people said wouldn't get to WWE. It was that class that sort of paved the way for that conversation to not really exist anymore. Well, you know, I can't say that, uh, but like other people can say that, and like I'm humbled by that. But uh, I can only speak for like my path, and uh, I believe like there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot to be said about doing things the hard way, and like I feel like my career, like I've done things the hard way the whole time, and uh, like, but at the same time, I had a great time in doing it, and like I never felt like the hard way; it just felt like the long road, you know, mm-hmm. and. Uh, there was never any shortcuts taken. And I think that's kind of like helped me be the performer that I am today. Uh, helped me kind of remain composed and like, you know, calm in like high pressure situations, like at raw and stuff like that. And, uh, and on pay-per-view. So uh, like definitely the whole process like benefited me. And uh, if, you know, people didn't believe uh, at one point, uh, you know, and maybe some of them still don't believe right now, but uh <laughs> <laughs> you know, who am I to say? Uh, all I can say is, like, I'll, you know, I've started at the bottom on the Indies in the United Kingdom. You know, I started at the bottom in New Japan. I started at the bottom in NXT, and I started at the bottom in WWE. And, you know, I've performed on SummerSlams. I've performed on WrestleManias, and we're getting ready for uh, WrestleMania again in New York. So it's uh, it's been a wild ride, Sam. So you're basically the Drake of WWE. <laughs> That's what you're saying, right? And now I'm here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> are you uh, are you excited at the prospect of having a pay per view match with Drew McIntyre at TLC? I think that you know I don't know if people fully process because it was just announced earlier this week on on social media and stuff that that was going to be the TLC match. And you know I think it's kind of amazing to see you two in this you know main event caliber singles match where we're starting to get a look at what the picture of the universal title is going to look like over the course of the next, I don't know, year or so. And, you know, Drew McIntyre is obviously a standout and 
you're obviously a standout on the good guy side. Um, when do you start kind of going over in your head ideas for stuff you want to do in this match to to steal the show, I guess? Uh, you know, the idea is never to steal the show. It's just to go out there and, and have a good time, man. I think I'm still trying to process the fact that I've got a match with Drew McIntyre at TLC because I was, like, you guys found out on social media. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're just so scrolling like, through yeah, Instagram and, and you're like, ah. Oh. My verified tweets real quick. Like, WWE, oh. <laughs> Pin versus uh, Drew. Oh, man. But, uh, yeah. It's crazy because, like, we kind of come from the same general area of planet Earth, and we've kind of had, like, very similar, uh, like, career paths, but we've never, like, had a, a singles match, like, on TV. So, uh, you know, we never really crossed paths on the indies, like, kind of in the same place at the same time, but never, like, worked out there. And uh, this is kind of the first time that we're, we're getting to step in the ring against each other. And, uh, and you know, I'm sure he's a lot of stuff he wants to prove to me. I have a lot of stuff I want to prove to him, man. And really, I've got a lot of stuff I want to prove to everyone that's watching. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's it's good to be in the mix. It's good to be, like, kind of in that spot. And, uh, you know, I definitely don't take it for granted. So, like, TLC, I'm, I'm going to pull out all the stops. And Drew is kind of like you in the sense that, you know, he was obviously in WWE really early in his career, but he ended up having to go away and do things the hard way for a while. And then he comes back, yeah. and he's just a completely new athlete, a completely new performer. He's just working on an entirely different level. And I would imagine that even if you ask him, like, this is the best Drew McIntyre by a mile that anybody's ever seen. Oh, oh, for sure. I'm like, credit to him to be able to, you know, go through what he went through at an early age in WWE and then, like, regroup and, like, re reset his goals, refocus and, like, do it, you know, the way he done it, and come back in uh, so composed and completely like different, different Drew McIntyre. So, uh, you know, credit to him for that. Like, I have ultimate respect for how he's handled uh, his career, uh, and uh, you know, I, I think he's definitely proved a lot of people wrong as well in, in doing that. So, uh, like guys like him that have done that, uh, gender, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think they're 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 great. Like, um, they're great kind of guide for you know when this type of thing does happen to guys uh, at the WWE that they do get let go that you know the door's not always closed you know and there's light at the end of the tunnel and for the people who can you know refocus and, uh, and, and you know dig in and work hard you know there's a, there's always a way back and, and for those guys like I got ultimate respect yeah um, do you ever think to yourself like what would have happened if you had been plucked out of the New Japan Dojo or whatever it was like plucked out early and ended up in WWE before you were actually ready? Because I'm sure, like, when we're young, we all think that we're ready for success right out of the gate, you know? I mean, I, 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 yeah. I was I was ready to host a morning show when I was 21, and it wasn't until I was 35 that I realized what a failure, <laughs> a miserable failure that would yeah. have been. Um, do you ever think about that? Like, oh, my God, thank God that I didn't get plucked out before I was ready. Well, the offer was actually there, like, when I was 26, 27, 28. And, like, every year they came knocking. Uh, like, I'd, I'd done two years in the in the New Japan Dojo. I was kind of starting to establish myself in New Japan. And, uh, you know, there, there was a couple of phone calls made with, like, offers on the table. But for me, like, it never felt like the right time. And, like, honestly, when I finally came, I wasn't sure it was the right time either. But I figured, like, I had to, like, roll the dice at some point. And, uh, uh, you know, so... I'm kind of the type of person that uh, I'm never ready for it until I'm actually doing it. So uh, sometimes you just got to be brave and make that decision and, you know, take that risk. Uh, and, like, definitely, like, it would have been a lot different if, you know, that first phone call had it came when I was 26 and I, I came to WWE then, like, I, I don't think I'd be still here now. And uh, I'm, ver I'm very happy with the way, like, things evolved with my career and, like, the you know, the slow uh, progression that I've made year by year. So, uh you know, I wouldn't change anything. What do you think it was about that time that, that made, when you decided, okay, I'm going, what, was it that you had just accomplished so much outside of WWE that it was time to accomplish something new? Was it, like... It was, it, it was a combination of things. It was, um, it was like, I felt like I'd pretty much done everything I could do with New Japan, uh, like, personally, uh, you know, there was, there was, uh, you know, those storylines that were kind of been, been pitched around and, and thrown out there that like, you know, that's what I was going to go into. And it's just like, I didn't really feel like it was going to be any sort of different stuff. And, 
then I was kind of like, I was 32 years old. I was kind of thinking, like, well, if I do another year in New Japan, another two years in New Japan, will the door still be open in WWE? Because, you know, that's like almost five years ago and like the landscape was a lot different then. Like they were into younger guys and, you know, you know, uh, it just, I don't know. Every time when, when the opportunity came up, it never felt like the right moment. But I think uh, when it came up that time, you know, it kind of, towards uh you know I, I was about a year and a half into the bullet club stuff and uh when, when the opportunity came i felt like you know now is the time to go but I, I think i've kind of like peaked out and maxed out like not only like professionally but maybe personally mentally like i, I just needed a change i'd been in japan for eight years uh you know i'd been you know kind of doing everything that i could to to get to the top of new japan and i just felt like maybe it's time to you know reset and you know start back at the bottom and uh I, and kind of give myself a new goal and a new drive and a new kind of, you know, target to, to set my eyes on. So it just, at the time, it felt right. And uh, it seems to have worked out so far. It seems like it, yeah. <laughs> I, I would I would argue <laughs> yeah. that you were right by, by coming over. Um, yeah. we, we've seen, like, you know, WWE just posted the AJ Styles match from last year's TLC on their YouTube channel, yeah. which I'm glad they did because... You know, I, I think that the WWE moves at such a rapid pace. I sometimes get worried that certain moments, people don't think about them enough. Like, I, I think, I, I would hope that people haven't forgotten that, like, it was only a year ago that out of nowhere, with two days' notice, you and AJ had this classic dream match. Are you happy with the way that match went? And with as much, with as much sort of hypothetical buildup as there was to that match, uh, and then... When the match actually happened, where it's just like, oh, we're just gonna do it right now. Um, are are you happy in hindsight with that match? I'm happy in in hindsight, in the sense that like what could have been for that show, with like you know, uh, with the Demon versus Bray Wyatt and all that kind of wacky storyline that we were doing at the time. Yeah, uh, and, and then what it transformed into, which was like you know the match with me and AJ, and uh, obviously like it was unfortunate that you know three of the boys went down real sick but i think that uh you know i was the one that kind of came out with the with the silver lining on that one uh obviously like me and aj had never wrestled uh and like a lot of people would have maybe preferred uh you know having a big build up but man essentially we had the match it was you know from what i can remember it was a, it was a lot of fun uh I don't watch my matches back, so like I can't say if I'm happy or not. But like the fact that you're still talking about it a year later, and like they've just put it on uh, on the YouTube channel and stuff like that, you know, some people liked it for sure. So uh, yeah, I mean, uh, as long as I'm it was looking, fun, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm looking forward <laughs> to doing it again. Like because I felt like uh, that kind of happened like out of nowhere. I was still kind of finding my feet in WWE, kind of getting back out, off the injury, and I feel like you know in the year uh, that I've been back since, since that match. Uh, and, you know, I feel like I really found my feet in the ring and kind of working on, on a different frequency right now. So uh, I think like that match with me and AJ, like sometime in the future is, is going to blow that match we had before at the water. Yeah. Was that tough for you after you went down with the injury? Because I don't even think people realize that even though you, you won the universal title that year at SummerSlam, you had only had like three televised matches or something like that on the main <laughs> roster. So like after three yeah. after three matches, you go down with this injury. You're out for all these months, and you come back, and it's almost like you've been on the main roster the whole time. But you've had literally not only have you been out with this injury, but before the injury, you had no time to get acclimated to what the main roster even was. But the all of us watching were like, "Yeah, he's been here for eight months. What's the deal? Let's go! Come on, guy." <laughs> you know, I'm glad you pointed that out because like. I, w I hadn't got a clue what I was doing those first three weeks. Like I was still trying to figure out like how to work like live TV, how to how to like kind of like get acclimated with like the bigger venues that we were doing, the different talent that I was working against, uh, you know, all the different like office staff and stuff that I have, have to deal with like at Raw. And then like obviously I got down injured, and, you know, because I guess the, uh, you know the injury was kind of so high profile in, in how it happened, and then like. I never really went away because, you know, with social media and the 24 documentary and stuff, people kind of like got used to me being around. And, you know, they, when I come, finally come back, I haven't really been gone. So they've kind of been looking at me for a year. Well, like I've only had like, it's, when I come back, it's like my fourth match you know, <laughs> for, for, for WWE Raw. So like, uh, you know, I was I, like, 
I really believe like that, like from when I came back was like a reset. And that was kind of like my first match in WWE because like that was obviously trying to deal with the injury and adjust my style to, to suit, you know, how my body felt. And then like, you know, adjust my style to working for WWE, which I hadn't done yet. Like I was still kind of working the NXT style mm-hmm. and, uh, and kind of like, it really took like a year from like when I came back, uh, like right after WrestleMania up until like the WrestleMania with Miz and Seth. That was like, that was like a one year period. So that was like, it's a pretty short run uh, on the main roster when you think about it. Uh, so like, I feel like after maybe that mania is when I kind of started getting my feet going. And uh, like now I feel like I'm, I'm in, I'm in better like ring shape than, than I've ever been. So, uh, I think definitely a lot of people, like like you said, like took for granted that like how long I'd been around because like eight of those months I was just kind of, you know, tweeting stuff. You know? <laughs> yeah, I wasn't, re- I wasn't actually wrestling. Yeah, you were you were contributing to Raw as much as all the rest of us were. You were just live tweeting, like. <laughs> 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 but it is. I mean, I'd say it's a compliment to you the fact that nobody realized that you were spending a year trying to figure out how to do this stuff. The rest of us watching were just like, "Yeah, he's here. Let's get. We're doing it. It's time. We're here." Here now, nobody really realized that you were figuring it out as you went. Speaking of, by the way, speaking of people figuring it out, you've known Becky Lynch forever. You know, you 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 yeah. you've known her for for so many years, and and you were part of her training way 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 back when. Um, can you believe the run that she's on right now? And and to what do you credit the fact that this is all happening for her at this moment? Uh, first question, can I believe that this is happening? Absolutely, yes. Uh, second question, what do I attribute it to? I think uh, I've always believed that Becky had that in her. I just don't know that she believed it. I think like maybe in the last couple of months, she, she started to kind of like get that like self-confidence that, you know, that, er- that ever- I think everyone believed in her except, except herself. And uh, finally she got that self-confidence and, uh, and like she's been rocking and man, I think it's uh, it's uh, it's unbelievable to watch, and I think it's only going to get bigger, man, because uh, she is on fire right now, and it's it's incredible to see. And like, she's been around almost as long as me, man. She's doing this like 15, 16 years or something. So she's uh, she knows exactly what she's doing in the ring. She's comfortable, uh, you know her, her you know her promos are on fire, and uh, and and she's killing it. So uh, long may it continue. It really is amazing that. You know, when we watch you guys, right? When we watch, and I say you guys in, you know, men, women, everybody. Yeah. When you, when we watch uh, you perform, it's like none of us know what's going on in your head, right? And that sort of whether it's Becky's self consciousness, whether it's you trying to figure out, you know, exactly how to do this stuff. To you guys, it's probably kind of omnipresent, but to all of us watching, we never pick up on any of it. You know. Like I, I, I've always found that amazing that because I think we all have versions of it, whether we're wrestlers or not, like, like the stuff that exists in our head that we think is sort of, you know, written all over our face is invisible to everybody else. Yeah. Uh, I think like you get to a point in like any, any kind of profession that like you start doing it without even thinking. Mm-hmm. And I think, uh, I, I think it's at that point where like you become, like yourself, you know, uh, yeah. and, and you don't have to worry about, oh, what move am I doing next? You know, uh, what camera am I supposed to be looking at? You know, uh, sh- should I, you know, fire up the people right now? And uh, I think like once you start like living in the moment and actually just going out there and enjoying it, which I am now, uh, I, f- I feel like that's when you, you know, like you hit your stride and and you start delivering your best work. Like I remember for the, like the, the first six months of like coming back from the injury, I'd be like behind the curtain. I'd be nervous. I'd be pacing up and down. I'd be like stretching, like trying to figure out everything I'm doing, going through like every possible scenario in my head of what could happen, what will happen, what won't happen. Oh, what happens if if this goes wrong? You know, if he comes at me that way, what am I gonna do? And uh, and now like I just sit behind the curtain with my legs folded, like waiting, kind of to go. Hey, when when are they gonna play my music? (laughs) Yeah. I feel like once you get to like that level where like you're comfortable in yourself and and you trust your ability to like do it in the moment as opposed to like trying to like prepare everything and, and plan everything out meticulously, uh, that that's like when kind of stuff happens naturally uh, and that's when 
and if you perform at, at your best, like I'm sure, like you were the same when you were, you know, hosting shows in your 21, 22. You know, For sure. Like, trying to like plan out what sentence you're going to use, you know, or, or what question. We're now like we're just kind of like having a conversation. So it's uh, I, I feel like that definitely helps. So once once you stop you stop thinking about it and just going out there and doing it is what is when your best work happens. Especially because you only have I mean you only paint up twice a year so it's like you don't even have to worry about that anymore you you really do just sit back <laughs> well you see that's that's an interesting question right because I do it so infrequently now that like I forget how I move as the demon I forget the, the subtle differences in the entrance right uh, I forget like I, I, I forget the mannerisms that I used like six months ago to like represent like how the demon works so like n- Every time I go back to the demon, I gotta like re-educate myself beforehand and kind of step into that zone and that moment. Like now, when I go out there, like you know, I'm Finn Balor, but like that's just Virgo. Like underneath every all the layers of like leather jacket, entrance music, like you know, extraordinary man who can do extraordinary things. It's just like me, like the, the human that goes out there. But like when the demon goes out there, like I I need to like transform into like a different person. So like that mindset, like because like it's you know it's not. Like, I'm not tapping into it so often. Uh, like, that's, like, a huge challenge for me now because, uh, like, I got to figure out, like, how, how to do that every time again, you know? So uh, so sometimes, like, right now I'm, I'm very comfortable going out there being fan, but, like, uh, when it comes to the demon, like, I got to re-educate myself again, uh, you know, when I'm, when I'm going out there. So uh, that's kind of an added challenge, like, how infrequent we're doing it. So, uh, but at the same time, it also adds, like, you know, a lot of mystique to it and makes it more special. So, and um, I'm, uh, I'm just happy, happy how things are going. And here comes TLC. Yeah, and you got to remember to slap is, that. Uh, hey Sam, is there is there a stipulation in this match, or is it just a straight? straight? No, no. St- I've checked my verified mentions. No stipulation has been announced. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no stipulation has been announced so far, but who knows? Who knows? There's there. Yeah. It could. I, it could be. I don't. I don't know for sure. Um, yeah. Friday. This coming Friday, December 7th, tickets for NXT TakeOver New York, which is what this show is being called, Hall of Fame, Raw, and SmackDown for WrestleMania weekend and Monday and Tuesday all go on sale. Barclays Center, it's going to be an amazing weekend. You guys should jump on the tickets right away. And let's not forget, a lot of times these Raw and SmackDowns right after WrestleMania. It used to be the Raw after WrestleMania. Now it's the Raw and SmackDown after WrestleMania. That's when a bunch of people get called up. That's when theoretically, who knows, sometimes things get shaken up. If, and this is the last question, if the weekend of WrestleMania, you find out after whatever you do at WrestleMania, I know you don't like to think in advance, but just just bear with me on this one. If you find out, Finn, you have Monday off because you're going to be on SmackDown on Tuesday going forward. Do you take it as good news? Do you take it as bad news? Do you take it as a challenge and go forward? I take it as good news that I'm getting to step in a ring on Tuesday as opposed to not stepping in a ring at all. So uh, That's, that's a great uh, attitude. Uh, 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 <laughs> Honestly, man, uh, you could put me in a ring and like in the parking lot of a Walmart, and I'll be happy. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> once I'm in a wrestling ring, that that's all I care about. Whether it's a red one or a blue one or a yellow one or you know anything, uh, I'll be happy. We'll buy all these tickets. You'll get the opportunity to see Finn Balor in a ring as much as humanly possible. WrestleMania weekend, of course. TLC is coming up on the WWE Network, Raw, and every Monday night. Finn Balor, it's always such a pleasure. Thank you so much, man. Sam, good to talk to you, buddy. So you heard it here. We already know WrestleMania tickets are on sale. As of Friday, tickets to Hall of Fame and NXT TakeOver and Raw and SmackDown at the Barclays WrestleMania weekend will all be on sale. And these tickets are tough to get, especially the good tickets. They're especially tough to get, I think, because it's so difficult to buy tickets online. It's really, really complicated. You know what happens is, what the real issue is, is that there's so many websites, you know. You don't know where to go. You don't know which ones are legit. You don't know which ones are a ripoff. You don't know which ones are good prices. Luckily, I have figured out something for you, and that's every single one of you who you should be using SeatGeek. SeatGeek pulls millions of tickets into one place so you can easily find the seats you want for a price you're willing to pay. Yes, every purchase is fully guaranteed. You can shop for tickets on SeatGeek with confidence and... If you make SeatGeek your go-to ticket source for everything, then you can get tickets to 
all they have to offer. Sports, concerts, comedy, theater, whatever you want. And of course, wrestling. I've got the SeatGeek app on my phone. It's amazing. You know, I'm from New York, so all these New York events, they come up when they look at my location. But if you're not if you're not in New York, you're planning on coming to New York for this thing, you just type in. You could type in New York. You could type in WrestleMania. You could type in SmackDown. Whatever you want to type in. Type it in. You'll be able to find the event you're looking for. The seating chart comes up. You can pick exactly where you want to sit. If you don't care where you want to sit, I'll sit anywhere in that building. As long as it's a good deal, no problem. Because every seat is color-coded. Is, is it red? Is it yellow? Is it green? It's going to tell you what the best deals are. So not only are you going to get the best seats, you're going to get the best deals. Or you want to go in between, you go in between. Whatever you want to do, it's in your hands. And best of all, you act right now. And you guys, the listeners of Not Sam Wrestling, are going to get $10 off your first SeatGeek purchase. That's right. First time you use SeatGeek, it's 10 bucks off, and I'll say you're welcome for that. All you have to do is download the SeatGeek app and then enter promo code SAM today. That's promo code SAM, S-A-M, for $10 off your first SeatGeek purchase. Do it today. SeatGeek, life's an event. We have the tickets. Here is Sam Roberts. Here he is. I love that interview with Finn Balor, man. That was such a fun conversation to have with that guy. And it's just the note that he left is on. First of all, I always like the takeaways from this, from these interviews. You know, people forget that people who work in the wrestling business, whether it's wrestlers, whether it's broadcasters, even people who just, you know, follow wrestling for decades and decades. Like, it, it, there's just so many little life lessons to learn from these guys and so many little things to pick up on. And with Finn Balor, I thought, number one, the thing that really stuck with me was the conversation about figuring out when you get really good at something. And it goes back to Malcolm Gladwell's conversation about 10,000 hours. The way you become great at something is to do it for 10,000 hours. Really, it goes back to what Becky Lynch said, that hard work beats talent any day of the week. And that's true. Some people are born with natural gifts, but there's not that many of them. And even those people that are, how do you use those gifts, right? The real way, like Finn Balor was surely born with natural gifts to be a great wrestler. But you heard him. We didn't even know that it took him a year. It took him from WrestleMania 33 to WrestleMania 34, he said, to feel comfortable in the ring. What did he get in that time? Probably he finished off his 10,000 hours. You know, I can't count the exact hours, but you know, it's not an exact science. It's somewhere around 10,000 hours. But what I'm saying is he got, he, he, he put in the time that he needed to put in to get great at this thing. And that's what he's talking about, about getting to the spot where you can do what you do in your sleep. You know, where you can just pick up where you are, do whatever it is that you do, and not have to think about it. Just go for it and 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 worry more about uh, just having a good time doing what you love and not, oh my God, am I doing this right? I, I'm not sure. You know, and I, I think that that's something that, that anything that any of us have a passion for, the fact that we have a passion for it means that we want to be great, right? If you have a passion for something, you want to be great at it. And it's true. The only way to be great at it is just to do it and do it and do it and doing it well. And that's what Finn Balor is doing. Uh, also, just listening to him, you know, when I brought up the question about SmackDown, Listening to him talk about uh, wrestling and the fact that, yeah, he'd be happy if he were on SmackDown because every Tuesday he'd get to wrestle as long as there's a ring for him, whether it's in a, uh, an arena, a stadium, or a Walmart parking lot, he's going to be happy. And I believe it when he says it. He's just a guy that loves to wrestle, and he loves wrestling. And that's why I love talking to him. I mean, even, look, the conversations that we've had offline, this isn't a guy who just, like, when I tell you Finn Balor loves wrestling, trust me, okay? Finn Balor lives for this stuff he loves wrestling and i that's why i love talking to guys like that about this um so yeah great interview and i appreciate finn balor's time you know speaking of ten thousand hours that's probably what makes me such a good wrestling figure collector is that i've spent my life collecting right i haven't jumped on ebay and replaced my whole collection it's actually my collection and i got uh, called out by the major brothers on their podcast 
they want me to go. They're doing a, a, a charity drive. Let me look it up for you guys real quick because it's for the kids. You know, I don't I don't have any problem with anybody uh, ever ever uh, donating to people that are less fortunate. Major brothers, wrestling figure, whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, so they they talked about me showing up. First of all, I don't I, I don't think that they'll allow me to bring my nine finger Ludwig Borga. Uh, to the toy drive because I think they actually want toys that are in the package. But uh, the details on it uh, are um, you can send your brand new wrestling toys, figures, rings, championship t- chip titles, etc. Uh, by the way, cutoff date is December 11th. So send them by December 11th. Otherwise, after December 11th, they will not take anything for the toy drive. Peace and love. They will not take anything after December 11th with peace and love. But if you send it to uh, Create a Pro Wrestling at 95 Engineers Drive in Hicksville, New York, 11801, you can send your toys there. Um, Or I guess there's an event on December 8th in Lynbrook, New York. And I think they want me, I, they, they've asked me if I'm donating, they've asked me if I'm showing up. Look, maybe I'll show up, you know, if I have time in my busy schedule, maybe I'll show up, but maybe I need those two jamokes. First of all, Kurt Hawkins is full of baloney. He's been in the Not Sam studio. He's seen a fraction of my collection. So this idea that he tries to act cool with his friend Broski and act like he doesn't know that I have a fabulous wrestling figure collection is ridiculous. So whether we make this a public wrestling figure court trial, whether I have those two come down into the Not Sam studio and see the collection for themselves, and by the way, only the part of the collection that's displayed because I simply don't have enough room to display everything, maybe I'll show up for them. But maybe if I do that, they'll need to show up for me too. You let them know. If that's, if you want to, If you want to see the Flintstones meet the Jetsons in the ultimate in wrestling collection podcasts, you let them know too, okay? Let them know. Uh, Let's get into it. So much going on in the world of pro wrestling that we have to break it all down. It's the state of wrestling, and it's happening right now. It's now time for this week's State of Wrestling. All right, let's rock. State of Wrestling time here. Uh, Not Sam Wrestling once again. Of course, the only place you can see video of the entire State of Wrestling segment is at patreon.com slash Not Sam Wrestling. All the Not Sam shows that are uh, indie darling and above get this video every single week. It's a part of the access that you get exclusively over there on Patreon. Uh, I did upload to the YouTube channel for free a small section of last week's State of Wrestling segment, The Debate between myself and Katie Linendahl over Charlotte and Becky Lynch. And we'll get into Becky Lynch here on State of Wrestling this week for sure because just something I observed about what was going on with Becky Lynch this week on SmackDown. Uh, But we'll talk about her. We'll get there. She's not my number five story of the week. And you know what we do on State of Wrestling. We count down my, according to me, Sam Roberts, the last professional broadcaster, what the top five stories in the world of professional wrestling were and are this week. And we start with number five. And technically, you could argue that this isn't a wrestling story, but this is a WWE company story for sure. And anything that affects WWE as a company affects the wrestling industry as we know it in 2018. So the XFL leads off this week's State of Wrestling. And honestly, you know, I think that there is room for the XFL here on Not Sam Wrestling. As a matter of fact, come February 2020, we're not even going to cover wrestling anymore. It's just going to be football. I'm just kidding. I wouldn't even begin to know how to cover football. Okay, this is what I say uh, as we talk about the XFL. I don't know anything about uh, football. You know, they're talking about point returns and two-point conceptions and whatever. I don't know anything about football. Okay, I sit there with Pat McAfee. I look at all these people. We do the NXT shows. I look at all these people. They go, oh, Pat, you were such a great punter. I go, Pat, what does that mean? You caught the ball? He goes, no, Sam. And he pats me on the head. And he goes, let's just stick to talking about this wrestling, okay? I said, Pat, that's where I'm a Viking. Pat McAfee is as close to football as I'll ever get. And I feel bad for him because I feel like if you have played in the NFL— 
there should be some kind of reverence for you, right? The only people that make it to the NFL are the best of the best of the best. Pat McAfee is one of the greatest football players of all time in the world because he played in the NFL. There's thousands of football players that don't play in the NFL. Everybody that plays in the NFL on some level, one of the best to ever throw the pigskin around, as I've heard some people say. But me, I don't know anything about this NFL stuff. Apparently, he played in Indianapolis under the name Peyton Manning. That's all I know for sure. So I don't know anything about football. But what I do know is I watched the first season of the XFL about 20 years ago, literally 20 years ago. I say that without hyperbole. I taped on VHS every single game. So I have all the XFL games, full, complete, commercials, everything on VHS tapes somewhere buried in my parents' house. It's one of the few things left that I have on VHS from my tape trading days not available on the WWE Network. It's a bunch of Japanese death matches and every XFL game. That I still have in my VHS library and that I'm glad to still have in my VHS library. But I'm still interested to see what this XFL can do. Now, they announced that it will officially start the week the weekend after the Super Bowl. So whatever it is, six days removed from the Super Bowl, the XFL will kick off in one year, in 2020. So February of 2020, we're approaching this year's Super Bowl, technically takes place in 2019. Next year, the Super Bowl will take place in February of 2020. Six days removed from the Super Bowl, the XFL will kick off its first football thing. And it'll be very, very thrilling. I'm going to watch. I support the WWE. I'm excited about the whole thing. Um, I watched the press conference. And, of course, the, first and foremost, they announced uh, the locations for the teams, not the team names. I really hope the New York, New Jersey hitmen come back. But not the team names. But they announced the cities and they announced the stadiums. So we have – and it's interesting. I was What I was paying attention to – was uh, the venues that they're playing in. Because I know more about buildings from following wrestling than I do about football. So I know buildings. And I, I, was, I was interested to see that across the, that it really is a variety of, of buildings in terms of capacity, in terms of what they're built for, and in terms of weather, okay? They start by announcing that MetLife Stadium is going to house the football team for the XFL from They were saying New Jersey, but I'm sure they'll be built from either New York or from New York, New Jersey. But to play in MetLife Stadium from February until theoretically the end of April, beginning of May, something like that, I would imagine, is – that's quite an undertaking. You know, WrestleMania is going to be there April 7th. MetLife Stadium is an open-roof stadium. MetLife Stadium in 2013, when WrestleMania 29 went there, I think it was 2013, it was definitely WrestleMania 29, they developed a ring with heaters inside the posts. They had a whole system under the ring, and and it, it allowed the ring to be heated. They had to build an entire uh, special canopy set that would make it so that if it snowed or rained or anything, it wouldn't hit the ring. It would just hit all of us in the audience. Like, that's a real risk, and that's one night in April. You're talking about having to go through most of February and all of March in New Jersey every weekend or every other weekend, depending on a home and away schedule. That's a lot of snow. That's a lot of rain. That's a lot of bitter, bitter cold, you know? I don't, I, 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 I don't know if football, and I'm not saying like, I don't know. I'm saying I really don't know if football is enough to make people want to sit in a stadium that's outdoors in New Jersey in February and March. That seems tough to me, especially since the capacity there, it says, is 82,500. That seems like a lot. I don't know if with the football field it's actually 82,500. That seems like how much it could seat for like a concert or something. But... I don't know. This thing that I'm reading says 82,500. Somewhere in the 75 to 80,000 seat range. It's a lot of seats for a football team that has not even been named yet, uh, especially in February and March. 
it'll be interesting to see. I'm kind of surprised they didn't go with the, there's a, a soccer field right near there, right there in the Meadowlands complex. So I'm kind of surprised that they're going with MetLife Stadium and not with the soccer field, which is what a bunch of these other cities are doing. New York, New Jersey, the first one. Arlington, Texas uh, is the second one. And that is going to, that's they're, they're calling that the Dallas team because Arlington is right outside of Dallas. But that's Globe Life Park. So they're not doing Levi Stadium where they did WrestleMania 32. Uh, they're doing Globe Life Park, which is the baseball stadium, I believe. The Texas Rangers Stadium, that holds 52,000. Um, and I guess they're going to have to build a football field in the baseball stadium. I've never seen that done before. But like I said, it could be done every week and just nobody told me because I don't watch a lot of football. Uh, Houston, Texas, also getting a team. That's going to be a TDECU Stadium. That's a, a the college stadium there in Houston. That seats 40,000. Okay, so already you're talking about half of what MetLife Stadium seats. I would imagine, based on the uh, capacities of these stadiums that they're playing in, that there's a pretty good chance that the championship game is going to be in MetLife, just because it's by far the biggest place that they're playing in. Uh, They're going to Los Angeles. They are going to be playing in Los Angeles, and they're supposed to be. I don't think the new Los Angeles stadium actually opens until 2021. Um, I do know that Los Angeles has trouble getting people to come out for football, and that's interesting because that's the one place where the weather is almost guaranteed to be good, but I think there's just so much going on in Los Angeles, and there's not a lot of uh, loyalty to the city of Los Angeles by the residents because so many people in Los Angeles are transplants that, generally speaking, a lot of the people in L.A. didn't grow up in L.A. They moved there from somebody else, so you don't have that same sort of team loyalty, but that's not to say they won't. The Los Angeles team is playing at the StubHub Center, which seats 27,000. That seems way more realistic in the range of where I would think the XFL sweet swat, sweet swat, 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 swat would be. Sweet spot would be. Um, maybe a little higher, but probably not much. Between, you know, the, the kind of twenty five to 40,000 seat range, like the TDECU stadium seems 40,000. That's okay, you know. I don't know. That, that seems about right. It just 80,000 seems like a lot. Uh, But that's Los Angeles. Then they go to St. Louis, which I think is going to be a big city for them. Even I know that St. Louis is pretty hungry for football after losing their team. So hopefully they can get some team loyalty going. Uh, That's going to be at the Dome at America Center. That's, uh, I believe, where the Rams used to play. That's 66,000, 67,000 people. Seattle's getting a team. Seattle, Washington, 72,000 people at CenturyLink Field. Uh, They're getting a team in Tampa. At the Raymond James Stadium, that's 65,000 or so people. And then Washington, D.C. at Audi Field. That's another outdoor venue, and that's 20,000 seats. That seems pretty small, but again, XFL is a bit of a startup. Um, The weather seems like it's going to be a big deal in Washington, D.C. and New York, New Jersey. So we'll see how that works out. But something that I thought was interesting about the press conference was how they were talking about the game. Now, we still haven't gotten into specifics about exactly how this is going to be differentiated from the NFL and exactly how they're going to change the rules. You know, the world that we're living in right now is very different than the world that we were living in when the XFL first came out. The world we were living in when the XFL first came out was edgy, 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 all content, they were, they were pushing everything, it wasn't just a WWE thing, the Attitude Era was not something that existed solely within the WWE, the Attitude Era permeated mainstream culture, so everything was edgy, 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 everything was raunchy, everything had questionable language, you know, you were looking at the most popular things on TV, you were looking at the Jerry Springers, and the Beavis and Butthead, and Jackass, and stuff like that, where, you know, the sensitivities of the viewing audience were far, far less than they are today. Today, people are a little more aware of things, people are a little more sensitive uh, themselves, and to the people around them, and they simply don't put up with the same amount of stuff. So the XFL is not going to be this edgy version of the NFL. And it's not even going to be sort of the smash-mouth, hard-hitting football league because if anything we've learned in the last 20 years, it's that the NFL is crazy for letting these players do some of the stuff that they were doing because of the the health risks and, and the true nature 
I mean, the concussion research that's happened in the last 20 years alone is enough to completely change the game. So they are talking about making it a, a faster-paced game. They are talking about making sure that every game fits into three hours, um, which will be interesting because that means there will be games that are actually shorter than an episode of Monday Night Raw, uh, even without the overrun that the WWE doesn't have anymore for Raw. Uh, but in the press conference, a couple of things. First of all, the chairman of the XFL strikes me as completely separated from WWE, and that was a big thing. He struck me as a commissioner, or I think that's what his title was, who knows, of a football league. And the WWE did say that they were going to keep the XFL and the WWE as two completely separate entities. Will they? I doubt it. You know, there, there's just so much at the fingertips of WWE that it's tough not to use it, right? Like, there, it, it, it's tough not to use it just because of a rule that you really put in place yourself. So I would imagine that we'll probably, just like we did the last time, see a little bit more intermingling than WWE might even really think they're planning on doing. But I don't think that we'll see wrestling announcers calling the games. I don't think that Jesse Ventura will be the sideline reporter. I don't think we'll get a um, Vince McMahon, this is the XFL. I don't think The Rock is going to make a cameo. You know, I, I, I don't think that there will be quite as much WWE involvement this time as there was last time. I don't think we'll have the locker room cams and the upskirt cheerleader shots and the, all this stuff. Okay, all that stuff is going away. This isn't going to be the attitude version of the NFL at all. If anything, it'll be safer than the NFL because what they pointed out when they were talking about the XFL was something that I think that the WWE is and should be focused on as they look at this thing, and that is what is the WWE good at? Coming off of the XFL, what is the WWE good at that translates outside of a wrestling company? Number one is something that they highlighted huge in the press conference outside of the announcement of the cities, and that is technology. If you watch the 30 for 30 something about the XFL, something that they did well was point out the technology that the WWE, the production that the WWE brought to football that the NFL still uses today. The camera shots, the actual physical hardware that is used in terms of camera and in terms of the skyline shot, uh, the way the mics are on the field, the way it's just, it, it feels like it's, it's coming off of the field, out of the TV and into your living room. The WWE is what brought that to football. And they introduced that through the XFL, and the NFL was able to borrow all of that and change their presentation of the game. Um, there's no doubt that the WWE, whether you say what you want about them, whether you're a fan or not, is on the forefront in terms of media companies. They are on the forefront of technology on a regular basis. The WWE network, in terms of s streaming networks, I mean, and in terms of live content, like, think about it this way. Amazon Prime... Hulu, Netflix, iTunes, HBO Go, all these big streaming companies. They don't do live and streaming. They just do streaming. WWE, every 30 days, has a giant, at least every 30 days, has a big live show that they stream on the network that a huge, huge percentage of their subscribers are tuning into to watch live all at the same time. And the network doesn't go down. You know, you might have heard here and there some complaints about the streaming when the network first launched, but you don't really, that's not even a conversation anymore. The WWE network just works. And it's, it's taken for granted now. It's not, people don't even say, yeah, you got to give them credit. The network always works. You just assume it'll work and you move on. But the fact is that that's a major, major accomplishment. That's a very difficult thing to do. So... When the XFL was talking about uh, the technology, the XFL app that's going to be state-of-the-art, the way that the games are going to be presented, the way we're going to have uh, access to watch the games across multiple platforms, the, the, all of that, they're going to be able to they're going to be able to beat the NFL in terms of the way they use technology and in terms of the way they get their product in front of people because they also don't have these big network contracts necessarily that the NFL is beholden to. Okay, so that's one thing. The, the 
production and the technology that is going to go into presenting football, that is a spot that the WWE should focus in on or Alpha Entertainment should focus in on as they present the XFL. Another thing is the uh, 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 portrayal of the players and allowing fans access to the players that they never had before. When you look at professional athletics, WWE superstars are far more fan accessible and relatable and attainable than any other athletes on the planet. You know, the amount of, whether it's autograph signings, whether it's social media, whether it's uh, uh, me ac media media interviews that they're doing, like you really get to know a WWE superstar. And that's by design. That's something that the WWE creates on purpose. And I think that that's something they're going to try to do with the XFL is make household names out of these guys by giving fans tremendous access to them, which I think uh, is important. But... I think a big part that they talked about was uh, the safety and the drug testing. I mean, let's be honest. You say what you want about WWE, but in terms of concussion research and action, they're light years ahead of the NFL. In terms of drug testing, they're ahead of, I, I think, most professional sports organizations. It's the, it's the, those are two things that the WWE takes tremendously seriously, is their wellness policy and the concussion issue. I mean, how many giant superstars in the middle of storylines have been taken out of action because of concussion issues or because of wellness policy violations? There's no real exceptions. I don't think, unless I'm wrong. There's no real exceptions to those rules. And that's something that the, the WWE obviously holds extremely, extremely dear. And I think that that's important to know too. And to take note of, too, that, you know, the WWE is not going to put the game ahead of the safety of its players. And quite frankly, I would imagine with the XFL, there will probably, hopefully, the XFL will be able to get security footage of their players committing crimes quicker than the NFL is able to. The XFL certainly won't let TMZ get access to security footage of their players committing crimes before they do the way the NFL does. So, you know, those things I think are the XFL is going to be able to prosper with. I just, and they keep pushing. We're set up for long-term success this time. Okay. I mean, I don't know enough about football to be educated on this, to tell you the truth, but, you know, I don't know. I don't see a reason for the football season to be as long as it is. You know, when they start doing these college games and there's 150,000 bowl games, I don't understand any of it. By the time the Super Bowl is done, I usually watch the entire Super Bowl. I watch one game a year, start to finish. By the time that one game is done, I think to myself, I don't need any more football for another year. But the XFL has given it to me, so we'll see. We'll see how it does. We'll go to story number four. And story number four is Rhino on Monday Night Raw. Rhino was uh, fired. You know, there was a, a match, uh, impromptu match, between Heath Slater and Rhino, and Rhino lost, and uh, he was fired from WWE. Apparently, after the show went to commercial break, he did grab the mic and he thanked the audience for everything. Uh, and I think the prevailing thought is that this is real life. It's not just fantasy. Uh, Rhino, I guess, done with WWE, and it wouldn't shock me. I would think at this point in Rhino's career, he probably doesn't feel the need to be on the WWE's schedule. He probably feels that he's accomplished just about everything he can accomplish in the WWE. You know, I mean, look at his this run that he's had in WWE. He's pretty much, I think, been around since right around the brand split. And he and Heath Slater had a, had a good run at the beginning of SmackDown. Of course, the first tag team champions. Heath, you know, I need this job. I got kids. Rhino's walking around with his crackers and uh, spray cheese. It was a fun time. But what I want everybody to do, I want all you uh, not Samsonites to do, is turn on your WWE Network and go back to early 2000s ECW. Now, maybe I'm just saying this because I'm just a e ridiculous ECW fanboy. You know, maybe my bias is built in. That's very, very possible. And I'm freely willing to accept that. 
free willying to accept that. But just watch it. Do me a favor and watch it because Rhino in ECW and and Paul Heyman did this a lot. You know, Paul Heyman's gift of all time in the world of wrestling was to hide people's uh, shortcomings and accentuate and highlight the things that they did well. Paul Heyman was able to turn Rhino into a true man beast. You know, Rhino never accomplished the things that he accomplished in ECW in any other organizations. And he's got a pretty storied career. You know, he had a, a... a bit of a run in WWE after ECW. He had a run in TNA that was pretty significant. Comes back to WWE. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of story with Rhino that I don't think gets talked about nearly enough. But watch that initial ECW run with Rhino. It's very clear that if ECW had stayed in business, Rhino was the guy that was having the rocket strapped to his back. Rhino was the athlete that was going to take ECW if they were able to stay in business to the next level. Uh, I don't know that that potential that Rhino had was ever fully tapped. Um, I don't... If Rhino is done wrestling, if he wants to be done wrestling, that's cool. You know, if Rhino feels like uh, he's made his mark and he's ready to go off into the sunset, that's cool. If not, if Rhino still feels like there's a little gas left in the tank, the question is, what's next for Rhino? And I, again, I don't look at Rhino in the last year or two and say, wow, he's not really doing much anymore. I go back and I look at Rhino, you know, 15, 20 years ago in ECW. And I look at that, not quite 20 years ago, but a little more than 15 years ago. And I go, man, that's a guy that I would love to see again. I think that if I'm Rhino, I go, okay, is there any place that I can add value to that I won't need to work the WWE schedule for, but they can also add value to me and and put some money in my pocket. If I'm Rhino and I'm Impact Wrestling, I'm making a deal. I think that Rhino should make his return to Impact Wrestling. We were just talking about Impact Wrestling with Josh Matthews last week. You know, there's a a bunch of places. He could go to Ring of Honor, of course. But, you know, with, with... I feel like Ring of Honor needs to pick and choose with who they bring in in terms of guys that have been around for a while. I think Ring of Honor really should be looked at as a young man's territory. For a long time, Ring of Honor was looked at as the spot where future stars of wrestling would go. And that was the Seth Rollins generation, the Adam Cole generation, the Kevin Owens generation. That's three separate. It went from the Seth Rollins class to the Kevin Owens class to the Adam Cole class, in my mind. And all three of those classes, I mean, of course, you had other organizations, you had Pro Wrestling Guerrilla, you had spots, but those guys all came from Ring of Honor. So in order to keep that alive, I think you need to keep exploring young talent and making big, big stars out of them. Ring of Honor, of course, they have Bully Ray. I think they still have him. Uh, And... I don't think you need Rhino and Bully Ray in an organization right now, especially an organization like Ring of Honor. I think Bully Ray almost, and I don't know if he would like this or not, to me, when I see Bully Ray in Ring of Honor, I think of him as almost like a Terry Funk type position in the sense that he's really there to add some fame and credibility to the organization and to make the younger guys look better. Eventually, we could beat him at first and then blah, blah, blah. But at some point, he's really there to put the young guys over, as they say. And I don't think you need two of those guys in a ring of honor. They also just signed PCO, which PCO is a unique case because even though he is obviously a legend, you know, he's Pierre from the Quebecers. He's Jean-Pierre Lafitte. You know, he had his WWE run in 93 to 96. So he's certainly a legend, but his new character is what is what's taking over the indies, and he's not really relying on his previous incarnations. He's he's building this new kind of psychotic version of himself, and I think that that's going to be really interesting and really cool to see in Ring of Honor. Of course, Jeff Cobb is now in Ring of Honor too, so there is a there is some uh, some buzz building in Ring of Honor, which they're going to need if they lose Marty Scurll. Cody Rhodes, 
Adam Page, and the Young Bucks, hypothetically. Ring of Honor is really going to need to build from that. And in order to replace those guys, I don't think they need more guys like Rhino. I think they need more guys like Jeff Cobb. So what does Rhino do? I think Rhino belongs in Impact Wrestling right now. You know, you've, you've got a set of TV every month or so. So he can come in, he can do that. I think that he's got to come in like a beast, just taking everybody out. I think you can build to a Johnny Impact versus Rhino match, whether it's on pay-per-view or whether it's just a TV thing. I don't know. But I do think that Rhino may have a main event run in him left in TNA. I mean, in Impact. If not, I still think that right there in the mid-card, he can be pretty well utilized. If I'm Impact Wrestling... I'm looking towards Rhino right now. And if I'm Rhino, I'm looking towards Impact Wrestling right now. I think that's the move that is going to benefit both parties the most. And I think it'd be cool to see. I think there's plenty for Rhino to do in Impact Wrestling right now, especially since they're in a moment where they're rebuilding. But I think that it would be Impact Wrestling responsibility to bring in Rhino from the, the final days of ECW and not Rhino from the current days of WWE if they can remind people of that Rhino I think they'll be in in pretty good shape pretty 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 good let's go to story number three and story number three is actually a a spinoff of story number four and that's a raw in general so I redid raw on the podcast last week on the state of wrestling segment with Katie Linendahl nothing that I said happened I think I said that you should split up Drew McIntyre and Dolph Ziggler. That happened. But it happened in reverse. I said that Drew McIntyre should be a good guy, and he's a bad guy. Um, You know, I guess we could start with Dolph Ziggler and Drew McIntyre. You know, when I did the interview with Finn Balor, I did the interview on Monday. So it was right before Raw taped. And I was like, you know, it's really interesting. Then I was looking at them. I was like, yeah, Drew McIntyre's never been pinned. I think you could build something really cool between Finn Balor and Drew McIntyre. I'm glad that Dolph Ziggler and Drew McIntyre aren't together anymore. But maybe they are. You know, maybe this is just something where Dolph Ziggler is going to surprise everybody at the pay-per-view and still be on Drew McIntyre's side. Because otherwise, I don't know why you rush that like that. To have the breakup and grudge match between Dolph Ziggler and Drew McIntyre happen over the course of not two years, not two months, not two weeks, not even two days, but two segments of Monday Night Raw, the beginning, middle, and end, we saw it all. Dolph Ziggler turns heel, and we get the first pin on Drew McIntyre since returning to the main roster, and it's not done by Finn Balor. You know, the story coming off of Raw, as far as Drew McIntyre goes, is not only... Did he turn his back on Dolph Ziggler? But then he got pinned by Dolph Ziggler, which gets me excited for Finn Balor versus Drew McIntyre, right? No, it gets you excited about a potential rematch between Dolph Ziggler and Drew McIntyre. You know, the stories are getting totally confused. So that's why the only reason, the only way that works for me is if this is a farce, is if it was a hoax the whole time, and Dolph Ziggler is going to go back on Drew McIntyre's side, which I still think would be a mistake. Um... I think there's a couple of simple things that need to happen on Raw. Uh, the the women's uh, open debate questionnaire portion of the show, I didn't understand at all. I didn't understand it at all because even though the questions were obviously scripted, it didn't really seem to lead anywhere. Um, even a tease between the Sasha Banks Bailey breakup doesn't really do anything for any of us because there's so much start and stop with that thing and you know I don't nobody really believes that it's gonna happen and if it does happen nobody believes that it's permanent because we've been teased with it so many times but to have Alexa Bliss stop the bad guys from interrupting the segment and then to have Alexa Bliss impressed when Sasha Banks and Bailey won it doesn't make any sense to me because we're led to believe that Alexa Bliss did make the bad guys come out and attack Bailey and Sasha Banks last week. And we're basically confirmed that Alexa Bliss absolutely 
had the bad guys come out and jump Sasha Banks and Bailey when they had their match to find out who was going to join the Survivor Series team. So why now, all of a sudden, does she not want them to be attacked and is actually impressed when they win a tag match? It made no sense to me. I think the only way to get out of this is, you know, Bailey and Sasha... I think, you know, you, the, the, I, I think Alicia, I, I still like Alicia Fox a lot, but I think that just because of the way, you know, I don't, I don't think it has anything to do with them as performers, but the way we've been taught to look at Mickey James and Dana Brooke is kind of bottom of the card for women on Raw. And I think that fans desperately want a reason to cheer for Sasha Banks and Bailey. Fans desperately want a reason to believe in Sasha Banks and Bailey. I think fans want a reason to remember the NXT TakeOver match in Brooklyn between Sasha and Bailey, one of the best women's matches of all time in WWE, quite frankly. You've got to do the turn. And at this point, you know, I mean, I, I still, my preference would be to turn Sasha because I, I just think that Sasha is a great heel and has not had the opportunity to exercise that in the WWE in the, on the main roster in all these years. She was a great heel in NXT. Sasha's ratchet. No, she's not. Do we remember this? Bueller? Bueller? Go back on the network and watch. People loved it. Sasha Banks coming out at TakeOver in the Escalade. Like, this is Sasha Banks. A real character, the legit boss, dripping with ego. That's the Sasha Banks I want to see. Now, it would still be interesting to have Bailey turn on Sasha Banks, but I think realistically and for long term, you've got to have Sasha Banks turn on Bailey and give these two a match on pay per view where they've got 25 minutes to either bring down the house or, you know, or we're, we're done. And not to say we should get rid of them, but okay, you can go back to being a tag team or whatever. But give these women a chance, and by that I mean not just give them time to have a great match, but time to build a great story. People don't want to see them as a tag team. People want to see them fight each other. There is no women's tag title happening anytime soon, unless I get informed of otherwise. And if there is, that title's going to have to go between brands because there's not enough women on one brand to have a tag title. If you have a tag title and it's brand specific, half the women on Raw are going to have titles. It'd be like the Attitude Era. There's going to be a European title and a light heavyweight title and a hardcore title and an aces high title and, a, and a, every title imaginable. Can't have it. So, you know, I, I think we should be less concentrating on building tag teams in the women's division if there's not going to be tag titles and concentrate more on, on giving fans what they want, which is Sasha Banks versus Bayley. I also, you know, I liked... I actually like Dean Ambrose's entrance on Raw. I like the coat. I like Dean Ambrose as Bane. You know, I like Bane Ambrose. Well, Seth Rollins. <coughs> I like it. What I don't like is that Dean isn't being that much of a lunatic. He's kind of being a coward. You know, he's insulting people's hometown and he's running away from Seth. If I'm watching this show, I'm led to believe that in a one-on-one -on -one encounter, there is no doubt in my mind that Dean Ambrose is going to end up being Dracula's elevator. You know what I mean, baby? He's going down for the count. Ha, ha, ha. In the words of the great Vito Carlucci. Look, I want to believe that Seth Rollins should be afraid of Dean Ambrose going into this thing. That's what makes Seth Rollins a good guy. Give me a reason. Number one, give me a reason that on that the night that Roman Reigns announced he was battling leukemia, give me a reason why Ambrose decided that was the night to turn on Seth and explain to me why he's the lunatic fringe. And when you do, show me why Seth Rollins is so afraid of Dean Ambrose. And I don't mean make Seth Rollins a coward. I mean make Seth Rollins go like, wow, I have a major mountain to climb here because Dean Ambrose is a dangerous man. Not, if I can tear Dean Ambrose security guards away from him, he's going to be an easy pickings for me. 
Dean Ambrose is a former WWE champion. He's the lunatic fringe. Let's remind people of that. You know what I mean? I just think it's important. That's that. That was my takeaways from Raw. Let's move on to story number two. Both story number two and story number one are from SmackDown and are from two of the most noteworthy performers in WWE right now. Story number two brings us to Becky Lynch. Of course, we're talking about Becky Lynch. Uh, we talked about her at the beginning of the segment. Um, her tickets for her meet and greet that are going down at the Royal Rumble in Phoenix, which, by the way, I may have a little announcement about Phoenix next week. Uh, meet and greet Becky Lynch tickets went on sale and apparently sold out in 90 minutes. All No other meet and greet sold out that quickly. Apparently, Becky, Grinch, Becky Lynch meet and greet. How Becky Grinch stole Christmas. Becky Lynch meet and greet tickets sold out in just 90 seconds. That's how popular she is right now. I stand by everything I said with Linendahl in that debate. I mean, Becky Lynch is in a position that no woman and almost no talent in WWE history has been in right now. Uh, this is a really, really incredible time for Becky Lynch. But I get scared. And the reason that I get scared is because I've watched SmackDown very, very closely the last two weeks. And I think the build to this TLC triple threat women's ladder match has, again, just like the Becky Lynch-Ronda match, I think as of today, what are we looking at at TLC? We're looking at Finn Balor versus Drew McIntyre. We're looking at Bobby Lashley versus Elias. We're looking at WWE Championship Daniel Bryan versus AJ Styles. We're looking at TLC women's ladder match for the championship, Becky Lynch versus Charlotte versus Asuka. As of right now, as of today, when I record this and when I talk to you, the triple threat women's championship match, TLC match, is definitely the best built match going into this pay-per-view. Again. And, of course, Nia Jax versus Ronda as well. The triple, the SmackDown women's title TLC triple threat women's match is the best built up match so far. Two fabulous Actually, I guess technically three fabulous segments on SmackDown. The opening this week, the opening last week, and of course that Battle Royal. So, why do I why am I afraid for Becky? You know, I think Charlotte is looking like a million bucks. I don't think Charlotte has any worry about uh becoming the next John Cena or the next Roman Reigns just because people still appreciate her. She's just so so good, you know. I love Asuka. I think that uh, her, her her comments should be brief, as they were on SmackDown. Maybe even a little bit more brief. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I like that we're we're starting to see the mean streak again in Asuka. Remember in NXT when Asuka didn't quite turn heel but kind of was doing some heelish stuff to make sure that she won? I don't mind that. I like remind, being reminded that Asuka is around to hurt people and is very, very dangerous. Uh, and I thought we got a little bit about a little bit of that on SmackDown this week. But the reason that I worry for Becky Lynch is because of three words. Shut your mouth. Two weeks in a row, Becky Lynch has been told to shut her mouth on SmackDown by Charlotte. And two weeks in a row, Becky Lynch's mouth has gone shut. When we look at this Becky Lynch character, okay, Conor McGregor is a phenomenon in the UFC. We should not be looking at Becky Lynch as a female Stone Cold Steve Austin because we're living in a different world. Becky Lynch is not Stone Cold. The WWE is closer to having a Conor McGregor type of performer on their hands with Becky Lynch than they ever have been with anyone else. But when he's promoting a fight, if somebody tells Connor to shut his mouth, he does the opposite. There's no way he's shutting his mouth. Becky Lynch should not be getting one-upped verbally by anyone ever. I think that the WWE is maybe putting a couple of breaks on Becky Lynch so that Charlotte gets a little bit more time to shine 
because I worry that the WWE is still looking at Charlotte versus Ronda Rousey as the match that they want at WrestleMania. When in reality, the match that the fans want and the match that has the most potential to be a true main event for WrestleMania and not just a symbolic main event for WrestleMania. And this is no offense to anybody involved. But it's just the way the stories have been told and the way the fans have reacted. Becky Lynch versus Ronda Rousey in a singles match is that match. You know, I don't think that Becky Lynch should be shutting her mouth for Charlotte. I think that Becky Lynch should be running her mouth at all times because she's got the ability to. I don't think Becky Lynch should ever shut her mouth. Just keep talking about how great you are, about how you're the champ, about how you've beaten Charlotte multiple times. Charlotte, I may have gotten my face broken, but I beat you twice. I beat you on multiple continents, Charlotte. Who's this guy? That's the Becky Lynch I want to see, you know? I just, and I'm very sensitive to the Becky Lynch thing because clearly... She's still as over as she has been. She's selling out meet and greets in 90 seconds. The man t-shirts are selling. People are cheering for her. She's amazing. I'm not even, she, she hasn't missed a step at all. But what I am saying is that I get worried when I start to see what looks like a bit of protection being thrown Charlotte's way and Becky not quite being able to get the one up. And it's little things. When Becky Lynch walked out on Charlotte uh, on SmackDown, she should have brought the mic with her. She should have brought the mic and on her way out going, you know, when 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 Charlotte said to Paige, oh, you're just going to let your champ leave? You're not going to make your champ come back? When she was looking at Paige, as if it was up to Paige to tell the champ when she could or could not be in the ring. Becky Lynch should not have just had her back to Charlotte. Becky Lynch should have been on the mic, walking out, going, nobody tells the champ where to be, nobody tells the champ when to be. The point of being the champ is that the champ shows up when the champ wants to and where the champ wants to. Wherever the champ is, that's the place to be. Go full on Damone from Fast Times, okay? Hey, Debbie, isn't this great? You know why it's great? Because the champ has decided it was great. And when the champ decides it's over, that's when it's over. And that's the vibe that I want to get from Becky at all times. And I don't want to see that in her face. I don't want to see that in her eyes. I want to see this woman use her words. Because Becky Lynch is better at using her words naturally with no script than anybody else. I've interviewed everybody. And I'm telling you. I wish I could do this podcast with Becky Lynch every week. She's that good. She's funny. She's great off the cuff. She knows her character. She's confident. Just let her nail everybody. Don't be Stone Cold where you're stunning everybody. Be Conor McGregor where you're psychologically beating everybody and you're not touching them until you get paid. That's who Becky Lynch should be. And that's what I want to see more of. I don't want... Charlotte Charlotte controlled that segment on SmackDown. I love Charlotte. Charlotte is an incredible performer. I can't believe we are living in an era where Charlotte and Becky Lynch, this version of Charlotte and this version of Becky Lynch are sharing a ring on the same brand at the same time on a regular basis. We as wrestling fans are not worthy of having two performers like Becky Lynch and Charlotte in the same division at the same time. It's incredible. But the potential that you've got with Becky Lynch in this moment is like nothing I've ever seen before. Charlotte is good enough to talk her way and get her way and fight her way out of anything. You're never going to have trouble with Charlotte. But Becky Lynch is caught the wave. She's on a wave right now, and there is no reason to lay down and let Charlotte surf through. Becky's surfing that wave, and let Becky surf it. It's important. It's really important, I think. Because Charlotte could be the greatest women's wrestler of all time. But Becky Lynch could be the best wrestler of 2019. Not the best women's wrestler. Becky Lynch could be the best wrestler 
going into the next decade if we do this right. Charlotte will probably go down as the best women's wrestler of all time. But we have the opportunity for a female, Becky Lynch, to be the number one wrestler going into the next decade. And the only way you do that is if you let Becky Lynch be number one. Give her the opportunity. If she can't handle it, she can't handle it. Give her the opportunity to be number one. And that means if anyone on the roster, male or female, tells her to shut her mouth, the same Becky Lynch that's on Twitter is the same Becky Lynch that shows up on SmackDown, who's got a comeback for everyone, whether it's Chris Jericho, whether it's Seth Rollins, whether it's Charlotte, whether it's Asuka. Becky Lynch is there to shut you down. And let her, that's what fans want to see Becky Lynch shut people down. If you put Becky Lynch on TV, remember when Stone Cold, all he was doing was doling out stunners? To this day, who doesn't play 2K18 trying to get their, or 2K19, trying to get their finishing meter all the way up just so you can drop stunners on everybody? Becky Lynch verbally shutting people down is the answer to that. It's like the stunner. You know, let it happen. Let it happen. Uh, And we move on to story number one for me, actually, which was Daniel Bryan on SmackDown. You know, I was surprised that anybody on my uh, social media feeds thought that Daniel Bryan was anything but excellent. Watching somebody be able to move from being so earnest. Like, we've watched Daniel Bryan on reality TV. We've, we've gone with him on the, on the tragic journey of losing his father. We've gotten to know his wife. We've gotten to know his child. We've gotten to know what Daniel Bryan's like at home. We've gotten to see him go through depression. We've gotten to see him lose his career. We've gotten to see him get it back. Okay, Daniel Bryan, we've, we've gone through a journey with him as if he was Rudy, except a world champion version of Rudy. Okay, he got to be our champion for the first time in a long time. And Daniel Bryan is so good that he's able to bring us to a place where we feel like it's truthful and we feel like it's understandable, but we're booing him because he's a bad guy, okay? He is getting out of the what chance without stepping out of character. It almost seems like he wants the what chance because of what he's able to do with them. Because it points, it, it, it goes to his point that the fans are sheep and that they're stupid. You know, he is, a, he is being a true heel champion, a bad guy. I want Daniel Bryan to hold that title for a long time. I want to know more about, you know, his plastic bottles. And uh, I want to know more. And by the way, Byron Saxton, it's a true story. You should have seen this guy. Survivor Series, he went in and got his food early. They didn't put the chicken out yet. I went in a little after him. I got a chicken breast on my plate. I sat down. He was pissed. He was pissed that he had a whole meal and he had filled up and he had missed the chicken. Daniel Bryan's not wrong when he criticizes Byron Saxton in missing the chicken. But, or or eating chicken. But, you know, just the, the idea that like, He's justifying the dick kick by saying, I hit one guy in the groin once. You guys are destroying the planet. Who's worse? It makes it so that this dick kick that we've seen a hundred times, we saw The Undertaker do it to Brock. We saw Nakamura do it to AJ. You know, over and over. Everywhere we go, people are kicking people in dicks. And Brian has made it something new. Daniel Bryan has made it something new. Daniel Bryan has made Daniel Bryan something new. So that the story of this character is actually a character story and not just... Oh, yeah, he was gone for a while, but now he's back. We're actually getting to see a wrestling storyline with Daniel Bryan. And I think it's fabulous. I just think it's great. I am so excited for everything that Daniel Bryan is doing right now. I thank you guys for being a part of this show. Don't forget, if you want to support the show in the best possible way, not only should you hit up our advertisers, but... Become a Patreon supporter. It's real cheap to start out. It starts out at only like four bucks a month. At four bucks a month, you get uh, bonus shows, including uh, not only bonus states of wrestling, but captive audience shows where me and somebody who normally wouldn't be watching wrestling sit down and and watch a pay-per-view or a TV show on the WWE Network 
and it's a watch along experience. It's a full three hour pay per view, two hour, one hour TV show where I try to explain to my wife, my dad, my brother, my buddy why what we're watching is awesome. Okay, those shows go up a couple of times a month at least. You know, you're also a couple, you go a tier up, you get videos, you get the interviews early that are here on the podcast, the video versions of them, and you get the state of wrestling video in its entirety. You get, uh, you can go up another tier. You get live pre-shows when I'm home for the pay-per-views. You go up another tier. You get uh, uh, this Not Sam jacket, and you get free admission to any Sam Roberts Not Sam Wrestling live show. So much going on for the Not Sam shills at patreon.com slash Not Sam Wrestling. Uh, and of course, everybody gets the shows early and gets the shows ad-free. Thank you all for being a part of another episode of Not Sam Wrestling, and I will see you all next week uh, right here. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for listening. Follow at Not Sam on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Rate, review, and subscribe. This has been Not Sam Wrestling. Not Sam Wrestling.